perfect segue into the next talk, which is uh, James Mansell. James has worked on big data for a long time and provided a lot of advice to government. And so what he's going to talk about now is something that he's been working with us on in the Science Challenge, which is a blueprint for a data commons. Thank you, James. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, hi. Um, that was an inspiring uh, presentation because it talks about a lot of the stuff that I'm interested in too, which is feedback. Uh, and um, <clears throat> what I want to do here, just take a few minutes to share with you some work that we've been doing on thinking about this whole problem from a data perspective. So there's obviously a scientific lens you can put on this or a community engagement lens uh, you can put on this crazy and ambitious project. Uh, what I'd like to do today is put a sort of a data lens on top of it and, and share with you what I think we might do in terms of that, because uh, I think it's quite an important lens and it, and it does follow on from, from what the previous speaker said. Um, look, why do we, uh, I, I kind of see this as a big data problem because you've got multiple moving parts. If you're going to take on the whole country uh, and, and you know, uh, eradicate predators across the whole country, you're going to need to know what you're doing and how well you're going. You're going to need to be able to mobilise people, inform people, coordinate uh, your responses and that kind of thing. And um, I'll just share with you some of the work I'm doing in government at the moment because I've got my own pest eradication program on in uh, inland revenue. Um, um, for all of those of you who take cash jobs and that, just keep your hands down. Um, look, uh, we have a similar problem, right? We've got, we've got these people, you know, uh, who are stealing our natural resource um, of, of the, the polis' um, contribution to the tax base. And I was asked to go in there a year ago and help them stand up um, the ability to analyse the data in that. One of the things you, um, one of the first things I said to them really was, well, you, you actually can't just sort of go and analyse the data. You actually have to run a bunch of natural experiments. Um, you have to actually go out and see how well you're doing with all of your, we have a bunch of investigators going across the country auditing people. Uh, and you actually can't improve unless you're willing to uh, get feedback on your errors. How many times have I audited someone and not found anything, you know? Why am I spending all my time doing that? Is there some, are there other, some other predators over there sort of thing? And um, so it, it, it um, I was going to use an army analogy, but I, I, I thought I'd use a tax one instead. Um, so you need feedback. And, and one of the problems, of course, is um, even in, in tax, um, well, I was a bit worried going in there for the job because I thought, well, I'll only just get the IR5 form and that sort of thing. It's not much data. Um, but in fact, uh, what you need to do is grab data from, from many sources and allow data to talk to itself and talk to each other. And um, I think that's the problem, challenge you guys are going to have too. Uh, you'll have data from uh, volunteers from across the country, you'll have data from scientists, you'll have environmental DNA data. And one of the, um, one of the challenges is how do you actually manage all of that and get a consolidated picture of what's going on without costing the earth. Um, before I get into how to do that, uh, I'll just say a couple of words about data itself. Um, unlike a natural resource, it's not a perishable resource, right? Um, the more you use it, often the more value you add to it. If I analyse, you know, the, if I take a lot of uh, photos on my camera trap, uh, the ones that get analysed by the kids in school or whatever who find the ferrets, um, uh, they've added value to that data. It's now I know more about those photos, which ones contain something that I'm interested in. And so uh, there's no reason not to use it and reuse it. Uh, the second thing about data is um, what I call economies of scope. When you add two bits of data together, you come up with new, uh, new, new scope, new, new things you can do. So if you know my height, and that's sitting over here, uh, but if you know my weight, and that's sitting over here, you know two different things about me. But if you can integrate them, you can tell I'm overweight, you know. So you can, you can tell a third thing. And it'll be the same for you, and I, I assume you're going to analyse things by land packets or, or something, um, where if I know the, you know, genomic biodiversity of the streams and the soil and that, and I also know I've got somebody who's doing work on, uh, volunteer work on setting up bait stations and camera traps and monitoring what's going on with the predator population, other people doing science on something maybe unrelated on, on the number of wetters or something. Um, you can tell I'm not in your industry. Um, uh, it's when you add those things together that you start to, to get some interesting uh, opportunities to answer some other questions. Uh, and so economies of scope are really valuable in, with data. So I would encourage you, 
the real value in this is joining your data together and not keeping it in its little silos where it's only of use to the person who's collected it for the purpose which they were using it for. So reuse is important. <clears throat> so how do you do that? Um, I assume you guys aren't awash with cash uh, and can't sort of get a server farm like Google can and, you know, and, and, and uh, sort of you know, have a lot of data junkies running around doing everything for you. The way that it's being done these days is to heavily protocolize everything. Um, so you've got, kind of got this choice, really. Um, I could go to you and say, um, like I did to IRD, give me $26 million and I'll build you a big data lake and we'll integrate the data and we'll have this point solution. You know, I will purposefully have bespoke ways of integrating international tax data, credit card transactions, tax data, and putting it all together uh, so I can give you this big data solution that you want. <clears throat> the smart people are actually uh, protocolizing all of that. And I'll give you an example. Um, in Wellington here, actually, it came out of Wellington. Um, problem with city councils and regional councils is they have pipes, roads, and assets, and they've got data on these pipes, roads, and assets. Uh, but there's no protocol, there's no metadata standards which allows us to know this data about this pipe is pipe data and it's about the pipe data of this kind of pipe, you know, it's data about the data. Uh, and uh, a couple of years ago, um, the head of uh, planning and asset management got a group of people together and said, right, I'm sick of this, all you guys can't talk to each other and all these regional councils can't talk to each other and we can't have a shared view of the pipes and roads and assets. So they developed some metadata standards and uh, NZIER did some analysis of that and they said, well, you're probably going to save 10 million a year in management of assets because you'll be able to analyse them better. But the bigger thing that you'll save is about 100 million in IT costs because it won't cost you every time you have to translate this data into that data and then this data into that data and have all these point solutions. So developing protocols for joining things together is really important. And if you can do that, if you can say, I don't know, uh, so use a camera trap. Uh, if I take a photo, if I take a photo for the predator-free New Zealand community, can I develop the metadata standards around that such that anyone can upload it, anyone can look at it, anyone can understand it as a photo? And what else do you need to know about that photo, where it was taken, uh, what was going on? And then if a kid in a classroom finds a ferret, you know, you can tag a ferret to it and you'll know what you're talking about. And then that data can be reused or used in, Andrea wants a forecast of, you know, how's the predator free New Zealand going? We could put that up on the thing because if you know what the data is and you've got metadata about the data, you can then join it up and use it in lots of different ways. We could put it on a dashboard somewhere and allow people to monitor it and, and that sort of thing. Um, so protocol is really important. They make things cheap and scalable. Uh, now say uh, someone comes along and you've got a protocol standard. The other thing that does, of course, is allows innovation to happen. So if you've got, I don't know, 10 different bait station, uh, bait camera trap, managers and they all have slightly different ways of doing it. As long as they adhere to the protocol on what the data is that you want, um, they can innovate all they like uh, and you can have lots of people coming in and innovating because they know the APIs and the metadata standards. It's cheap and easy to innovate. Build an app, you know, maybe someone does one for an iPhone or something, I don't know. Um, um, then, you know, protocols uh, allow that to happen. One of the disadvantages, of course, is if someone really innovates, say takes a stereoscopic photo of a ferret or something, then you might have to change the standards. But that's easy, right? You change the standards and you innovate. But um, protocols allow you to innovate, to scale, to do this really, really cheaply. Um, so if you develop ways of storing DNA data, ways of storing photos, ways of uh, monitoring traps and stations and things, then you're going to be able to scale up and allow innovators to emerge who have different ways of doing it, who can then integrate with your data ecosystem. Uh, and allow that data ecosystem to talk to each other. And I'd say the same about volunteer communities. You know, if you've got the APIs and the metadata standards, some of these people are going to find better ways to do things and uh, allow them to talk into your data system. Allow them to know the protocol. Um, how long have I got? Five minutes. Five minutes. Um, <clears throat> but technology protocol is one thing. Uh, that's, that's great for sort of um, scaling up and, and innovating, doing this cheaply and that sort of thing. But, um, I haven't got a copy of my paper, it's a copy over there. Um, a group of us thought that that wasn't enough. A lot of the data sharing I'm doing in government is requiring people to, it's highly sensitive data. And having talked to some of people in your community, you've got sensitive data too. And there are often multiple interests in data. You know, um, it's not generally uh, have, just has one person interest in it. You know, maybe the farmer doesn't kind of want that data to be used in this kind of way while well, he's trying to sell his farm, I don't know. Um, one of the other things we want to do is form communities of common interests 
who have diverse interests but a common goal, like Predator Free New Zealand, uh, to co-design the social license protocols. What can you do with data? What are you allowed to do? I, mean, I know scientists want to publish or perish. I don't want to put all my data up on the commons and let someone else run off with my results and then publish before me. What are the rules? What are, how are we going to do that and manage everybody's interests so that we can collectively manage this crazy and ambitious project? Uh, and so one of the things that we're proposing in the data commons blueprint that we created is that an important part of building the protocol is to work with, within the communities of the diverse interests to collaborate around developing the protocol standards that they want to use. Not just the metadata standards of what counts as a photo or a, and a rat or whatever, but the standards around who can then use that for what and in what kind of circumstances and who has a special relationship. And we want to build a protocol around provenance. Who uploaded the data? Who's got a special interest in that data? Uh, around transparency. You know, can I see what people are doing with my data? Can I see the value that other people are getting from the data that I've uploaded? So, <coughs> excuse me, a minute. <laughs> um, I got, I'm funded by uh, Andrea and by the Next Foundation, uh, Devon, and by a bunch of other people. We had a process last year where we got a bunch of technology entrepreneurs, um, predator-free people, um, social entrepreneurs and NGOs, and we got together and we developed what we call the Data Commons Blueprint. Um, there's five copies sitting over there if you want to have a look. It's also on datacommons.org.nz if you want to download it. And it talks about a blueprint for how we can build these scalable data ecosystems which are high trust and low cost to allow communities with a common interest to solve their common problem uh, within their community. So that's probably all I'll say about that now. Any questions? Okay.